Let's just say mistakes were apparently made. Hello everybody and welcome. It has now been a year since Kerbal Space Program 2 was released into early access on February 24th, 2023. And let's just say that the reception was not unanimously positive. In this video we're going to talk about the things that led up to that, mistakes that were made, how things developed from there and then give an outlook on what we can expect going forward. If you have followed my channel for a while you know that I have pretty thoroughly documented the development of KSP2 ever since it was first announced. If you are new here, first off, welcome! Second, if this type of content interests you, go and hit that subscribe button. Not unlike KSP2, my channel has been in development for many years and I am trying to finally reach 100,000 subscribers before the year runs out. It's just a little tap for you, but it would mean a lot to me. Ok, now that we got that out of the way, let's get right into it. And just like you put your finger on the subscribe button, we're putting the finger right onto the wound. The hype bubble burst. Announced in August 2019 to a massively positive response, Case B2 was set to release in spring 2020. But then a lot of things happened. There was a development team shakeup under curious circumstances, which I made an entire video about, link up top and in the description. Then Covid-19 hit the industry and fans were confronted with multiple delays. Finally, in May 2022 it was announced that KSP2 would come out for PC in early 2023 and on consoles after that, without a timeline. Here's the exact quote from the official video back then. KSP2 is coming out on PC in early 2023 and on consoles after that. We did get a release in February 2023, but it was not the full game as the wording in that video might have suggested for many. Instead it was published as Early Access, a fact that was announced in October 2022, almost half a year after the timing update. Also, the game came out without many of the long ago announced features. And that second announcement continued to whet the player's appetites. One way that I can tell the game's ready for early access is that we can't stop playing it. In addition to that, there were a few promises made. We've also set ourselves a very high bar of quality. The game has to be performing across a wide range of machines. The graphics have to be peerless. The universe has to be rich and interesting to explore. One thing our players have been very clear about is that they want us to take our time and give them a quality experience with KSP2. So we're making sure that what they will be getting in early access is a strong foundation. While I do not doubt that the developers wanted, or rather still want, to deliver on all of these goals, the product that was delivered a year ago was lacking in all areas mentioned above. Hyped up by the marketing leading up to the release, expectations had been high. With a big publisher behind the studio, the messaging was of course trying to generate excitement before the release. Because that's what publishers do. On the other hand, there were some slight warnings if you listened carefully. Failure is not only an option, it's like absolutely mandatory. We're gonna fail out loud. Quite a few people got loud when something failed unexpectedly and in spectacular fashion. The first days of KSP2 were rough. And then there was the price. 50 bucks for an unfinished product in the state it was in caused a lot of people to be even more disappointed. Yet to me, whoever had to come up with a price for Kerbal Space Program 2 was put in a no-win situation. Let's be clear, the developers actually working on a game, the people you see in those feature episode videos and interviews and announcements, they probably didn't have any say so in that matter. KSP2 is being developed by Intercept Games and published by Private Division, a subsidiary of Take-Two Interactive. What's in the game and how does it work? That's in the realm of the development studio. Marketing, pricing, PR strategy, that's all part of the publisher's responsibilities. So what are they going to do? If the price is low and will be increased later, you create an incentive to buy now but let it lie on a shelf until development is finished. 
that's potentially detrimental to the purpose of early access where you hope to get valuable feedback from the community on core gameplay mechanics. And you're going to create some irritation in people that buy later and have to pay more than those that bought in at the start. If the price is too high, it of course generates expectations. $50 is up there in AAA territory, albeit on the lower end if we're looking at games priced at 60 or 70 bucks, not taking into account any season passes and deluxe super extra platinum and unobtainium packs that include one more skin each. I said this in my initial review of KSP2 back a year ago. With your 50 bucks you don't buy the game as it is now. You buy into the promise that it will one day live up to the many promises made over the years. Many expected these promises to be fulfilled right from the start, or at least a lot sooner, which leads me to our next chapter. The Uphill Battle I think the first reviews and reactions caused the team and publisher to savor a big piece of humble pie. Because there was definitely some hubris in play during development. When I was at PAX West and met the team back then, I mentioned to them off camera that I was skeptical that they could pull it off in the time allotted, especially when looking at how long it took for the first playable space program to get into a playable state. One of them gave me a reply along the lines of, oh, the original devs were just starting out and made a lot of rookie mistakes. We already have experience in game development and know what we're doing. That's not a direct quote, just how I remember the conversation. But let's just say mistakes were apparently made. Part of me hopes that the experience of development case P2 taught everyone involved how special the original really was and how much work Harvester and the others really put into it to make it lift off. The current devs had to put a lot of work into their fledgling game to calm the fans after the first release. Two weeks later they already put out a patch with 281 fixes, the next one a month after that. Over the course of the past year, 7 updates with a total of 1011 fixes were released, not counting hotfixes that were introduced in between. And all of those fixes were sorely needed since there were a lot of game breaking bugs. Parts falling off, ships wobbling themselves to death, orbital decay, trajectory lines disappearing… there was a lot. Still is, unfortunately, although significantly less. The development team had a big hill to climb and still has not reached the mountaintop, but I believe that they can now continue with a lot less ballast weighing them down. You see, my take on this is that with the release finally out of the way and the publisher stepping back a little, the studio was now able to again focus more on living up to those promises I mentioned earlier. While of course still not there, a lot was improved or newly introduced over the past year. Let's compare the part list of version 0.10 and the current 0.21. There are new parts like the three vacuum engines with extending nozzles. Those were not in the initial release. Neither were the shielded docking ports. But even with all the improvements over the months after the initial release, there were still a lot of naysayers because the game missed a very important thing. A reason to actually start it up and play. And that's where the new science equipment comes in that we got in December. So let's talk about the next step in the journey of KSP2. For science! An important milestone. While the patches and bug fixes were generally well received and improved the game a lot, many core features of the original Kerbal Space Program still hadn't made it into the sequel, let alone really new stuff like colonies, interstellar travel and multiplayer. Then came the Space Creator Day in October 2023, where they announced version 0.20 titled For Science. As the name suggests, it introduced science gameplay, which is now called Exploration Mode. I won't go into details here because I have a video highlighting the update in general and then a deep dive on the science part of it. I link to both in the box up top and in the video description. Aside from the science elements, the update also brought significant performance improvements and a cure for the bane of people who like to build complex vehicles like myself. No more wobbly rockets. Also, 
it looks a lot better now. This is again a side-by-side -side comparison of the original and the most recent version. Notice how the horizon is a sharp line on the left and more realistically blends together on the right and the light reflecting on the rocket does look a lot better now as well. Plus we have now atmospheric heating, which is still a bit buggy unfortunately. When you look at the map view, there have been a lot of changes compared to the initial release in regards to how things are presented. But probably the most important thing to me from a gameplay perspective is that we can now see delta V and thrust weight ratio numbers for every stage. This takes a lot of guesswork out of planning for a longer journey through the Kerbal solar system a great tool for experienced players. And with the new mission center, players can grab some tasks and explore new areas on planets and moons. Basically for science turned a buggy but charming rocket sandbox into an actual game. Before it came out I said that this would be the make or break update for Case P2, whether or not it would prove to be that diamond in the rough that I have called it a year ago. The point .20 update was a very important milestone and the voices that claimed the game would be dropped or never deliver on the promises of old started to diminish, but not quite. As I said before, the developers may have reached a second base camp, but they are not yet at the summit. That is up for the future of KSP2. When we look at the roadmap we see colonies, interstellar travel, resource management and then multiplayer as the main pillars of coming updates. Since we had point 1 as the initial version and point 2 as the science update, we can expect colonies to be point 3, interstellar travel will be point 4, resource gathering will be point 5 and multiplayer maybe still a point 6 before the final version 1.0 will come out after some polishing. I already did a video on when we can probably expect the colonies update, but the short version is that it might already come out this summer since the developers expect things to go smoother now now that they have established better processes within their organization. Since there are still people that are worried that the publisher will drop the game due to the high running costs and long development time, I asked creative director Nate Simpson during our interview back in October. We're not going to get the plug pulled. This is a long tail project with a very passionate, very committed fan base. We're funded, we're going to be fine and I do think it'll be a huge relief to get the game to a place in the For Science update where it is speaking for itself. By the way, the full interview and my When Colonies video are of course available on my channel. I told you it pays off to stay subscribed, lots of content already here and more to come. But in regards to the future of KSP2, I personally am a lot more hopeful after For Science came out than I was before that. I always had trust in the team, not only because I was able to get to know some of them in person and you can really feel how passionate they are about the game, but also because a lot of the original developers and some of the best modders for KSP1 are working on KSP2 now. However, there are a lot of variables in complex software projects like this and even the best people and the most experienced team can fail. As Prussian general Helmut von Moltke once said, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Actually he said it in a much more complicated way, but that's the gist of it. And this axiom is proven right in any project time and time again. Because Murphy's Law is also a thing. So no matter when the colonist update arrives, be aware that it will not be completely smooth sailing from the get-go. Speaking of smooth, let's smoothly transition to the conclusion for this video. With things as they are now, I personally can enjoy playing Case P2, but there are still quite a few gripes that I have with it. There are still bugs, not as many as before of course, but some are annoying me for a year now. For instance, custom key bindings. I have made a few and they always reset when starting the game. I have to go into settings, input and then the custom key bindings are back. It's a minor thing of course compared to other bugs, but little things like that always remind you that this game is far from finished. Also planning your journey across multiple stops. You can set consecutive maneuver nodes, but the game will only show you data for the first one. 
and you cannot set maneuvers for future orbits, something that would really come in handy when planning for rendezvous. And while performance was constantly improved, I do hope that the types of ships that I like to build won't slow the game down to one digit FPS numbers in the future. In general, you could argue that the developers overpromised and underdelivered a year ago and have since then begun to live up to those promises step by step. You could also argue that the publisher overpromised, leaving the studio no alternative to underdelivering, since all employees at Intercept Games and Private Division are likely under strict NDA, we will probably never know for sure. Whatever it is, those promises were made, and we do see work being done to make the game fulfill them one day. What do you think? Will they succeed? And when are they going to succeed? Let me know in the comments below or jump over onto my Discord server, where hundreds of you fine folks have already joined to chat among fellow space nerds. And if you really like what I'm doing, might I interest you in becoming a channel member? You get access to badges and special emoji and receive early access to videos before they become public. Or you could hop on over on Patreon, where we also have multiple tiers of support. I'd love to be able to create more content, but the reality is that YouTube does not pay the bills yet, so I have to keep at my day job until that maybe changes one day. If you sign up for one of the higher tiers, your name will show up here on the side like these wonderful people that believe in what I do. Thank you so much for your support. Okay, now back to the vehicle assembly building, I need to grab some more science for my exploration safe game. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.